a little bit about uh, about yourself and you know what are you doing currently and uh, feel free Jim it's all yours well I mean there's not much to say I'm a simple person who grew up in the, the backwoods of Alabama uh, I now live in Singapore I have a couple of little girls that uh, I do everything I can with and for and mm -hmm. I'm trying to trying to keep alive trying to survive these very difficult times so as you well know absolutely absolutely so Jim I mean you know you you you, you know you obviously seen the handwriting on the wall and um, you, as with many uh, American expats, have left the country you, you, for greener pastures. What do you see as the big transitions that are coming out? Or, or what was the big motivating factors for you when you said, you know what, uh, I, you, you see all these things happening, you see what's coming down, maybe it's time for me to look for greener pastures, and, and what is your perspective on, on the global economy as a whole? Well, there are many, many answers to that question, but the, but the initial answer is the reason I moved to Singapore, I moved here in 2007, was because I had a little, a little girl who was born in 2003, and I have been writing and lecturing and broadcasting for 25 or 30 years that everybody should teach their children and grandchildren Mandarin because it's going to be the most important language in the 21st century. Well, V, suddenly I had one. I had to do something, and it became, <laughs> it became very clear. I mean, she was speaking Mandarin in New York. We had a Chinese governess, but it became clear that if I really were serious, I was going to have to be in a place where she had no choice but to speak Mandarin. It wouldn't work in New York. So we set out. We looked at a lot of cities in China, but China's horribly polluted. It's just filthy, right. uh, the places we wanted to live. So we wound up in Singapore so that my daughter would know Asia in the 21st century and would speak Mandarin. Uh, as you may know, V, a lot of people do strange things for their children. They move Absolutely. to near a good f football coach or a music teacher or whatever. Well, we moved to Singapore. It's been, I, I have to say, I almost backed out the night before I sold my house in New York in 2007, but now I'm very, very pleased. We're all very happy here. It's a wonderful experience we're having. Uh, you know, any change, any dramatic change is usually good, uh, and this has turned out to be terrific. So that's the main reason I'm here. That's how it all started, and that's why we're here now. And rightfully so. I think that's that's the most important thing you do is make the proper decisions for your children. It's, it's I mean... I mean, I think about how many Americans just, you know, spend a lot of time trying to find the right football coach or, you know, or the right this or the right that. But, you know, you've really set up your, your, your kids for success. Absolutely. Well, we'll see. I don't know. They both are the, the best Mandarin speakers in this country, believe it or not, which is a shock to me. I'm very, I'm very proud of it, but it's a shock. But we'll see. V, just because they speak Mandarin and know Asia, that's not going to make them success. You can ask me in 30 years or 25 years if yeah. I did the right thing. But at the moment, we're all very pleased. Amen. Absolutely. So, uh, Jim, I mean, um, what, let's start about this economy. I mean, you know, you've been one of the voices in the wilderness that I've been, you know, calling this thing from Jump Street, warning the people, warning so many of the, the, the those who have a hear to hear um, what's coming down. Um, what is your take on, you know, where we are? What are your, what, you know, what's happening? And as we're seeing all the, the capital controls going in place in Europe, um, in, in America, I mean, it, just in the Western world, it seems like so fashionable for austerity and the war on cash and so many things. So what, what's your take, Jim? Oh, V, you really got the, good, the right insights because the world is at the wrong place at the wrong time and taking the wrong actions. Well, we can start with yeah. the fact that for the first time in recorded history, you have all the world's major central banks printing staggering amounts of money. Bank of Japan, Europe, Bank of England, Federal Reserve in the U.S. This has never happened in recorded history. You have interest rates at zero, which has never happened in recorded all over the world, not just in one or two countries. This has never happened. You know, V, everybody you broadcast to grew up being taught that you save your money and you invest for the future. Well, all of those people who did that are now being wiped out by the central banks in the world because they're getting nothing on their savings, whether you're a trust company or a pension plan or an insurance company, getting totally wiped out. And the, they're doing it for the people who did the wrong things, the people who went and borrowed huge amounts of money with no income, no assets. And so they're being saved at the expense of the people who did what I was taught to do and what most people were taught to do, 
And so we have a horrible situation going on, and it's going to end unbelievably badly. You mentioned the word austerity, which most people don't even remember anymore. Right. But there is, people talk about austerity. There's no austerity. Every government in the world has higher debt today than it did last year and will have higher debt next year. Right. The debts have been skyrocketing. The reason we had, one reason we had problems in 2008 was just staggering debt. Well, the debt is much, much, much higher now, V, than it was then. And the idea that you can solve a problem of too much debt with more debt is, I mean, it's ludicrous. It's ludicrous, ludicrous to me that grown-ups can stand up and say, ah, we'll solve this problem. We'll just take on more debt. We'll spend more money. We'll print more money. So we got a huge problem facing us, V. I, I know you're knowledgeable about it. I hope all your listeners are, are knowledgeable. I hope they're worried. And I hope they're all prepared because it's going to be a mess. Absolutely. You know, it, it's amazing to me that, you know, you, you, you know, we mentioned about you know, zero interest rate policy. Now you have the Fed even, you know, yelling, saying, you know, we might venture or, or think about doing negative interest rates. And I, I almost fell off my chair when I heard that because it hasn't worked in Europe. Uh, it's not working in Japan. Um, and now these boneheads want to try it over here. It's unbelievable. Well, it's more than – it's incomprehensible. You're exactly right. It's unbelievable. But it's, it's, to me, I just – I'm sure that five years ago, 35 years ago, the, the, this concept of driving interest rates to zero and printing money and running up debt would save the world. And now negative interest rates, uh, I, I don't think it's going to happen in the U.S. anytime soon, but that's only because there's an election coming. I don't think that they, the, even the central bank has the courage to say to the American voters, you're gonna, you have to pay to put money in the bank. Maybe after the election, because I mean, these people are bureaucrats, they're academics, they don't know what they're doing, and unfortunately you and I and you, all of the listeners are going to pay for it. Absolutely, and then on top of that, you know, I, I, I actually put out an article called Cash War on my website, roguemoney.net. And it's with that wonderful, you know, the, the gentleman from Harvard, Larry Summers, talking about it's time to get rid of the $100 bill. <laughs> I, I, I know. I mean, these are bureaucrats, and they want power. They thirst for power. But, you, you know, they take the power from you and me right. and all of us innocent citizens, all of us innocent bystanders, so that they can have more power and supposed prestige. Um, we need five hundred dollar bills. We don't need. We don't need to get rid of the one hundred. Let people do what they want with their money. Not let Larry Summers tell us what to do with his money. Right. Exactly. The, the, him and you know Ruben being the guys who helped end the Glass Steagall. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> well, we we have a long history of people going to Washington and either changing or certainly trying to change us and doing so. It's. Uh, uh, and, and unfortunately, both those two you happen to mention both went to Harvard, which is another problem with Harvard. But that's another story. Yeah, it's, it's like these Keynesians are, are peppered everywhere throughout the country in every every corridor of, of academia. Um, unbelievable. I mean, only only a fool would count uh, debt as an asset class, and and the, and it's a virtue. That that's what kills me. See, these guys are literally debt is a virtue for these people. I, I I know I know it, but again, we're in a phase in history where, as I said, we should all be very worried and we all, should all be prepared because whatever they do, B, what's going to happen is when things get bad, then they're going to try something else foolish, which is going to be wrong, and so. Be prepared for lots of mistakes because we have to deal with them. And obviously what we want to do is survive and maybe even thrive. But first we need to survive because these guys are going to make a big, big mess of what's coming. And then if we can figure out how to thrive and actually make money on these boneheads, it will be terrific. Right. Exactly. And that's the point. That's what I love about you, man. It's, just, it's all about – you know, leverage. And, and, and a lot of people, they would, they would hear, you know, things on alternative media and, and mainstream media. And oftentimes it is either, you know, pandering towards fear where people feel they don't have any options. And it's so important that people realize that in every single boom and bust, there are millionaires and billionaires being made. There are opportunities. And it's all about it. It, 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 it. These guys, you know, oftentimes, you know, I talk to a lot of people, they think these bureaucrats are gods, Jim, and they're not. These are some of the most fallible, most idiotic human beings put in power that I've ever met. 
or ever have the, <laughs> the displeasure of meeting, so to speak, and the opportunities that can be made from their mistakes are immense. Well, there were people who came out of the 1930s with great fortunes uh, and became, you know, very honored. John Templeton, you probably heard that name. Mm -hmm. You know, he was a guy who had virtually no money in the 30s, and now he's, well, he's dead now, but he, he made a vast, vast, vast fortune watching the mistakes of other people. So it certainly can be done if one keeps his head clear and is, is not afraid to go against the conventional wisdom because conventional wisdom is nearly always wrong, as you well know. And it will be again. So we have to figure out how to do it. What, what are the things uh, that you see coming down here, Jim? I mean, you know, there's so many things, so many things you've called that was just on the money. What do you see uh, in the next coming months, next coming years, uh, you see happening within the Western world itself? Uh, and in comparison to where you are, I mean, you being in Singapore, uh, with the experience you have in Asia, what's the big, you know, contrast? between the, the Eastern mindset and the Western mindset, and I see that there's a, there's a major divide here. I know it's a loaded question, so please take your time answering it. <laughs> well, okay. Uh, well, you know, 100 years ago or 125 years ago in America, everybody worked very hard. They invested for the future. In America, we were a debtor nation as a whole, but we built railroads and factories mm -hmm. and highways and bridges schools we were investing for the future and then we got the payoff in the 20th century and became the most successful nation in the world now we're the largest debtor nation in the history of the world v but we're spending the money on well you know what we're spending the money on transfer <laughs> payments we're paying to make sure the bureaucrats don't lose their jobs we're not building future competitiveness for our nation right. and that's going to hurt us more and more in the in the end in Asia now, they have that mindset that we used to have mm. uh, a long time ago. And, and then the world is full of historical cycles where some countries have it, they lose it, other countries get it. But in Asia now, the, the emphasis is on saving and on education. You right. know, in America, education is to make sure you have self-esteem. Well, in Asia, <laughs> in Asia, the emphasis is to make sure you earn your self-esteem. My yep. kids go to school here, to go to public school here, and I will tell you, my kids by the third grade have had more homework than I had in 12 years wow. in, <laughs> in the U.S. One of my girls came home from oh, the American club. There's a club here mainly for Americans, and she said to me, oh, gosh, at the American school, they don't even have homework. And I'm wow. sure she, she wasn't complaining. <laughs> she was just making a statement, and she was sitting here looking at, yeah, just but she was sitting here looking at a couple of hours, at least a couple of hours of homework every day, and she was in the third grade. So <laughs> they educate their children, they discipline their children, and they save and invest for the future. They work very hard. <laughs> you know, in China, when you come to work, you say, "How many days uh, can I come to work?" Whereas in America, we say, "How many days holiday do I get?" Right. Now. I'm an American. I love America. I vote. I pay taxes. Uh, but I'm telling you, I don't like saying these things uh, at this particular point in America's history. But you ask the contrast with Asia. It is startling to be yeah. here. You come to the airport in Asia and you see a, a staggering an amazing airport, which is very efficient in, in most Asian countries. You go to JFK and my yeah. gosh, B, you land in a third world airport. Yep. You go through third world immigration, yep. you go through, you get out in a third world taxi, you go on a third world highway. On third world even, infrastructure. <laughs> yes, yeah, I mean. I mean and, I, and that's if the police dogs don't bite you on your way in through customs. <laughs> exactly, yeah, if you get through customs. If, if you, you get, get through customs. customs. Oh, if they don't man. grab you and say, oh my gosh, you look, you look strange to us, I'm going to send you back. No, no, it's, uh, I mean, uh, again, these, we laugh, but it's not funny. It's unfortunate. No, it's, you're absolutely right. It, it breaks my heart. It really breaks my heart uh, to take my girls there and then show them, well, this is, this is what your passport says. And they, they see the contrast. I mean, they're old enough now to notice that there are differences and something's wrong. Uh, and I certainly notice it too. So you ask the differences. Um, there are big differences. In America, we're running up staggering debts. As I said before, we're the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, and the debts are getting worse and worse and worse. And V, history shows that no country that has gotten itself into this kind of situation gets out 
without a crisis or at least a semi-crisis. Right. And it's coming. It's coming. It, 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 I'm not happy saying it. I'm not at all happy saying it, but it's – and it's going to get worse. Be careful. I definitely agree with you. You know, there, there, I think it was Nicholas Taleb who said, you know, he coined the term black swans. Um, looking at the whole geopolitical, the, the whole geostrategic outlook, it's like we're being surrounded by flocks of black swans. It, it's, I've never seen the chessboard arrayed in such a way as this because it, we have so – it's not just one thing. It's like multiple things that are all interlinked where – one fuse lit could set off a chain reaction of of consecutive events that can cause destruction at a, at, a, at an alarming and very fast pace. That's what freaks me out. It, it it's, I mean, it's scary. You know, I always say this, Jim. It, you know, people are like, well, you know, how many, how many, how much more years we have? It doesn't matter how many more years we have. The fact is, we're hanging on by a thread, and the fact that we are hanging on by a thread should should provoke you to do something. Well, it's, it's, it's worse than that uh, because the debts are going so high and right. the regulations and controls are going so high that when it hits, I'm afraid it's going to hit, as you point out, quickly. But then the problem is going to be, V, that the people in Washington are going to say, oh, well, we will save you. But the ways that they come up with to save us are just going to make it worse because they don't understand the problem. You know, it's amazing that the people who get us into the problem – are then going to be the ones who get us out of the problem. They think, they think, get right. us out of the problem, but it will just make it worse and worse and worse. They didn't understand the problem in the first place. It's like in 2008, the same old guys just went around and said, okay, we've got to save Goldman Sachs. We've got to save Merrill Lynch. We've got to save our friends. We've got to save Citibank. And so they set out to save them, uh, not caring about the real problem. And now, of course, eight years later, huge debts, huge money printing. I mean <laughs> – it breaks my heart to hit. The, it breaks my heart to be on this show to talk about these things. Yeah. But unfortunately, it happens to be true. Right, and you know, you said it best. It's like these are the same guys that caused the problems. I mean, you, I mean, let's let's take a look at this. Where you have a guy like Paul Krugman, okay, oh. Nobel Prize winner in economics. And when I listen to the things that come out of this man's mouth, I I I, I ask myself a question: How many acid tablets did it take to get yourself to this level, Paul Krugman? Because his answer, and I know you've heard this before, Jim, where he literally said, "Why don't we just you know mint a eighteen trillion dollar coin and pay off the debt?" Or maybe we should. He even said this: "Maybe we should fake an alien invasion." <laughs> I know. But he said it with a straight face. He said it with a straight face. I, I know. I mean, people like you sit and say, well, what did he say? Did, that, did I hear that right? You go back and you read it, and that's what he said. That's what he, I had to pause my TV and rewind it and watch it again. I, I said to myself, he did not say that. He said it with a straight face. I'm like, well, oh, my God. I, at that point, I knew that all hope was lost. <laughs> Part of his problem is he's got an Ivy League education. He teaches at an Ivy League university, and he won a Nobel Prize. So he thinks he's smart. Uh, unfortunately, he's not. And unfortunately, you and I are going to pay for it. But I mean, Bernanke is the same way. You know, he's got an Ivy League education. Uh, what's her name? Yellen. Yellen. She's been, she's been down there for 15 years. She's got an Ivy League education. Now, listen, I have an Ivy League education, too, so I'm not just totally anti-Ivy League. But I, since I have an Ivy League education, I know how bad it can be. I know how it can ruin people. And right. it has certainly, certainly ruined that crowd. <laughs> You're absolutely right about that. I mean, you, uh, you know, I have, I have a colleague of mine who, who refers to Yellen as the Lyndon, B, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson of the financial world, she, she is someone who's just been in the system for the longest time, and just believes whatever fictitious data is put out by the BLS, the Bureau, the Bureau of Lies and Statistics. It's it's unbelievable. <laughs> oh, no, man. I know, but 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 again, it is incomprehensible to you. It is incomprehensible to me. But they think they. I hope they think they know what they're doing. I hope they're not just complete charlatans. They don't know what they're doing. Unfortunately, people like the New York Times think they do. Uh, people like Congress think they know what they're doing. But again, this is, this is the problem that's happening in America. There are some places left. Uh, Asia has pockets where people know you have to do things differently. I mean, you talk about the people. I mean, look at Alan Greenspan. Alan Greenspan 
who was their predecessor, never really made it in the private sector. That's why he kept getting uh, – he used to be on Wall Street where he was – he had a company, but it was uh, – many people laughed at it, but he did have a company. He got himself a job in Washington two or three times because he couldn't make, make it in the real world. Well, he was a man that the press, as soon as he got to Washington – Thought well, he must be a genius. He must be a con. None of them went back to find out who he really was, and so they they listened every time he opened his mouth. They thought he knew what he was talking about. Every time he opened his mouth, I gagged. But you know, and he turned out to be hopelessly wrong, as did Mr. Bernanke, as did Mrs. Yellen. But the problem is, the problem is, V. While we can decry and and moan, they're doing things that are going to hurt. Uh, they're going to affect. Let's say it start off saying it's going to affect all of us. I say it's going to hurt us. We have to. We have to. First of all, be knowledgeable about what's going on. We just can't sit here and say, "Oh my gosh." But then we got to be prepared. We got to do something. It's if we. You. If you look out the window and see a tornado coming, you can say, "Oh my gosh, there's a tornado coming." Blah blah blah. But you got to do something, or you're not going to survive. So I know you're helping people to figure out how how to prepare for all of this and survive all of this. And uh, let's hope we do. Let's hope that uh, 15 years from now, 10 years from now, we're all looking back and saying, well, we survived, we made it, the country, the world has survived, which may not happen, but let's hope it does survive. Right. And uh, so keep up the good work and, and try to make people understand that this is, this, is not, this is not an entertainment show. This is real world. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there's nothing conspiratorial about what we're saying and what we're talking about here tonight is people need to understand these are the things that if anybody would just take five minutes to use this wonderful invention called Google, you can figure out very quickly that what we're talking about is actually verifiable truth. And it's amazing to me. There was a meme that I, I was reading today on, 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 on one of these sites. It, was, it, was, it came across my desk. It said that it's incredible that in such an age of information that we literally have a deluge of information that we have so many ignorant people, and it's unbelievable. At this point in this juncture, ignorance is a choice. Well, yes, V, but we have a lot of information, but judgment yeah, judgment is the problem. If 100 right. people go into the same room in Washington, D.C., for instance, and listen to, to the Federal Reserve or Janet Yellen, you know, only 95 of them are going to come out of there. Uh, I mean, 95 of them are going to come out not knowing what's happening. Only five or six are going to come out of with come out of there with good judgment and say, oh, my gosh, you know what this means? Yeah. Now we've got to do something because, unfortunately, judgment is still in short supply. We all have massive, massive amounts of information, instant information. Right. Judge, I mean, if, you, if, if you can figure out a pill for judgment, boy, you'll save the world and you'll get very rich. <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, judgment's hard to find these days. I, it's always been hard to find, but especially these days. And, and part you, of the problem is we we all have so much information. We think we know what we're doing. Right, right. You know, and, and historically, one of the the greatest developers or teachers of judgment or dis, or development of discernment has always been suffering. Suffering always increases some judgment and discernment on you. And uh, I think we, <laughs> I think you know, sad to say, we you know we we've had it so good for so long. We've become very, you know, almost like very decadent in how, and very lazy affair in how we process information and what we really truly care about. And you're right. If, if, there's, if there's a way to get rid of the – a lot of people say cognitive dissonance. If there's a way to get rid of that, Jim, and, you know, we get people to think, it'll be, oh, my God, it'll be, it'll be a whole new world at this point. Well, I hope you can keep trying. I hope that uh, you, you keep it up because yeah. – there are not many voices in the wilderness, uh, right. unfortunately, but but keep up the keep up the good work, and maybe maybe some of us will survive, and then maybe on the other side we can start over with a better a better process, absolutely better situation, absolutely. But it's it's not going to be easy because as I said before, America's got the largest debts in the history of the world, right. and the debts are going higher and higher and higher, and nobody in Washington seems to be aware of it or care. Mm -hmm. And Janet Yellen says, "Yep, they all say pile on more debt, and everything will be okay. Ruin the people, ruin the people who save for the future. It doesn't matter." 
you know, we know what we're doing. Well, unfortunately, they don't, and we're going to find out the hard way. Right. Absolutely. Well, Jimmy, we have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of pundits, a lot of, you know, um, uh, individuals speaking about the the crisis in China and 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 uh, the Chinese economy is imploding. This, that, and the other. Uh, one of the things I do know is that you know, even though the Chinese do have bubbles and issues within their economy, they don't have the type of systemic problems that we have. Number one and number two, I know that their debt—they don't have any externally held debt, kind of like we do. Uh, what do you see in the Chinese mainland, the Chinese market? Uh, do you see the type of uh, fear mongering that the Western media is putting out there with the Chinese market, or, or how bad is it, or what's really going on? Well, that's very perceptive and good insight that you bring that up because uh, I'm sitting here in Asia. I, I see a lot of the American press, and I'm always saying, did they really say – I mean, it's like Krugman. You say, <laughs> did they really say that? You know, first of all, uh, if he, last year, the, the Chinese stock exchange was one of the strongest in the world. Yeah, it had ups and downs, but at the end, it was one of the strongest in the world. The American – the New York stock exchange, while the averages were flat, um, twice as many stocks were down – on the New York Stock Exchange as we're up. If you look at the breadth, it did peak in August of 2014, and the markets have been telling us some. The markets in New York have been telling us something is wrong. Uh, it's been disguised by a few big stocks, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft. You know, a few big companies kept the averages up and disguised what's really happening. So the real problem, in my view, is Washington, D.C., and that's why the New York markets, the American markets, have been deteriorating for a year and a half now. Now, China has problems too, but we'll, we'll come to that. Um, the, the American economy is the largest in the world. You, well, Europe as a whole is even larger, Japan, of course, but the, the, those three countries – or areas, the U.S., Japan, and Europe, are four times as big as the Chinese economy, mm -hmm. four times as big as the Chinese economy. So we've got to keep things in perspective. Now, in, in America, they just shriek and shriek and shriek about China without putting a few facts on the, on the page. Correct. And now, China's having problems, yes, but if, you're, if your major customers, which are four times your size, are having problems, you are too. Japan, the Japanese government will say we are in recession. Many countries in Europe are in recession and they will say it out loud. So China has the problem that countries, customers, which are four times its size, are having problems and therefore China is having problems too. Now, I'd rather be in China because China has huge reserves, but having said that, B, in 2008, when the world ran into problems, China had virtually no debt and lots of savings, and they started spend, you know, saved up for a rainy day. Many Asian countries had, and they started spending for the rainy day. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, unfortunately, China, too, has debt. It's not like Portugal. It's not like England. It's not like America, but they, the Chinese have debt, too. So the Chinese are getting whacked by the problems of their customers, and – it's going to be worse for them than last time because they've got debt. Mm -hmm. uh, they ran up a lot more debt than they should have. So you're going to. And, but the good news is the Chinese government has said we're going to let people fail uh, right. if they if they fail. Now that's wonderful news to me because that's the way economies are supposed to work. In America, we refuse to let people fail. We refuse to let people go bankrupt. We bail them out. Uh, China says. This is red China. This is communist China, I hasten to say. And they say the way the world is supposed to work, the market is a better judge, or judge than bureaucrats. This is what right. the Chinese Communist Party says in writing. <laughs> you know, if you, it, It's amazing. They say the market is a better judge than bureaucrats and politicians, whereas in Washington they say, no, 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 we've got to save Goldman Sachs. We got to save our friends. You know, mm -hmm. they'll lose they'll lose their Lamborghinis if right. we don't if we don't bail them out. So China has said they're going to let people go bankrupt. It's going to cause pain. It's going to cause fear. Uh, certain the people who go bankrupt are certainly going to be in pain and fearful. And the press is going to say, "Oh my gosh, people are going bankrupt in China." But that's good news if you ask me, uh, because then you clean out the system. The way the world is supposed to work, V, I mean, you know this better than most, when people get in trouble, they're supposed to go bankrupt, competent people come, 
take over the assets, reorganize, and start over from a sound base. Unfortunately, in Washington, what they do is when people get in trouble, they take the money away from the competent people, give it to the incompetent people, and say to the incompetent people, well, now you compete with the competent people with their money. Now, this is, this is absurd <laughs> economics. It's absurd morality. But that's one of the reasons that we, we being the U.S., the West, are having more and more problems. And Asia is on the rise. I mean, you asked yep. these questions earlier. I, I, I don't like saying any of it. I'm appalled. I'm stunned. I'm shocked. I'm, I'm paying the taxes. You're paying the taxes right. for, to support these policies. So we, we've got the, these problems facing us, but China is going to have problems, has, is having problems now because its customers are having problems. Uh, they have some internal problems. They subsidize some things they shouldn't. P- p- property, real estate has had a bubble in some parts of China, but these problems are minuscule compared to the ones of their customers. But don't think right. that China's don't think that China's not going to have problems. B, in the 19th century, as America was rising to power and glory, mm-hmm. we had 15 depressions with a D. We mm-hmm. had a horrible civil war. We had massacres in the streets. We had very little rule of law. You could buy and sell con- – well, you can still buy and sell congressmen, but they were cheap in the 19th century. You could buy three or four for the price of one now. So America was a mess, yet we became the most successful country in the 20th century. China's going to have plenty of problems. Don't think they won't. But again, in my view, I'd rather be in China in the 21st century with my investments than the U.S. I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. It's it, it's amazing. I think it was uh, back in the 80s. Um, I just don't remember who it was, but it was a gentleman from the uh, the Soviet Union at that time uh, who, who penned a book. And in that book, he says, uh, as you know, the time moves and marches forward, we're going to see Russia and China become more free, and the United States become more enslaved. And then he and then he says something so poignant. He said that the American will go into his slavery beating his chest and yelling to the world how free he is and the world would look on and just snicker i was I, I was blown away and now to actually see this happen in, in my eyes where it is easier for me to go to moscow and open a business it is easier for me to do business in china it's easier for me to do business pretty much anywhere in the, in, in, in the world Rather than the United States, and when I look at the the the, the uh, uh, you know the democracy index, that we're like number forty three. I think we're slightly above Romania, Jim. <laughs> we're, we're slightly above Romania, and, and 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 like what you said. I mean, these are things we we kind of laugh about, but we laugh in pain. Well, we yes, uh, I, I'm, I'm shocked. I'm shocked to hear about that book. Uh, I mean, whoever he was, I, I'd like to find what he's saying now because yeah. he certainly got that right. It is, it is amazing to see the difference. Of many of the things that you and I grew up with, like uh, the, the right to privacy, or yeah. that they had to have a search warrant to, to break down your door. They don't have to do that anymore. They just break down your door. I mean, many of these things that you and I grew up with. The freedom of speech is now being curtailed everywhere. Freedom of religion. I mean, all of these things that you and I learned in school or from our parents or grandparents. I mean, they're, it's astonishing how they're being corroded. And yet, in, and I know many people who'd rather go to Asia or even Russia to do business than in the U.S. Not that there are not problems everywhere, including Russia and including Asia. Uh, Asia but no, it's it's very very painful. For someone who, like me, who grew up believing everything that I was told, right. only to find out, oh my gosh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, these guys have been watching the wrong TV shows. Mm. Mm. Exactly, exactly. And, and speaking of which, I mean, you know, being from New York, um, when I heard that uh, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia just dropped dead, first my initial thoughts were, okay. All right, you know, he, he probably had some health issues and he, and he passed. And then when I heard that the, you know, they found him with a pillow over his head, I said, wait a minute, you know, people don't have heart attacks with pillows on top of their, on their faces. It just doesn't happen. And then there was no, and I found it very suspicious that no autopsy was ordered, 
they were, you know, rushing his body out to El Paso, Texas, which was a few hours away, and just, you know, driving around killing time with this guy's body. And, uh, and I'm like to myself, I'm like, you know, I don't know what the truth is on that, but there is some suspicious things. But one thing, one thing that does cause me to shudder with the removal of this, of uh, Antonin Scalia, is the fact that now there is a, a propensity to have these benches stacked with judges who will just about legalize anything at this point. And now the first thing that I came to my mind, Jim, is you're right. It's, it, was, it was the freedom of speech. And I thought about that. And I'm like, okay, you know, how is this going to be curtailed? These judges who ramrodded Obamacare down our throats, what are they going to do next? What are they going to do with, with uh, you know, what we're able to put on the Internet, on blogs, on, on you know, on free media, on, on radio? It's I shudder to think of the thought and – it's almost as this. Uh, I'm waking up in a crazy Nazi fantasy. It's, 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 it's <laughs> I have no other words for it, Jim. Well, uh, again, that's in good insight because some of the laws that we have in the U.S. they also had in Germany in the 1930s. Uh, Bingo. I'm, I'm not suggesting that we're a Nazi country or anything, right. but I am. Uh, these are facts, whether we like it or not. And unfortunately, it's happening. I have, I don't know what happened to to Justice Scalia any more than than you do. Right. But uh, I, I I did read. I thought I read that he had been cremated uh, almost instantly, which of course. I don't think was – well, I read that it's not his wishes to be cremated, but he right. was without he an was, autopsy. Uh, yeah, correct. And that's the other thing. that you, you, I'm glad you brought that up because it's uh, – the guy is a, a hardcore strict Catholic. Like he goes to Latin mass. But the last thing he wants to do is, is be cremated. It's not, it's not what they do. <laughs> uh, well, oh. again, I wasn't there. I have no right. idea. I only know what I read on the on the in the press. And as as you and I both know, the press can be, Fickle. even the internet press can be, uh, strange at times. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, but one must be careful. Right, and, 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 and the, at the end of the day, it's not the 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 death we should be concerned about. It's about who's going to replace them and what laws they're going to enact. That's the bigger concern. I mean, we could, you know, chase all sorts of uh, boogeymen and, and, and whatnot and waste our time with it, but we really need to focus on, okay, who is going to replace this guy and what other freedoms are we going to lose because of this? That's the bigger issue. Um, Jim, really quick, man. Um, you know, we got about two minutes before the end of this uh, break, um, and I guess on the, you, you can continue this on the, on the other side of it. Is what do you see going on in terms of cur the currencies markets? Um, you know, I see the dollar strengthening. Uh, there are people saying that you know the the you know the Chinese are going to devalue again. Uh, why do you think the dollar is just artificially propped up, and why is it so ridiculously high when when there's so much tumult globally? Well, that's why, because there is so, so much tumult, and in times of uh, turmoil, people look for a safe haven. Now, they think the U.S. dollar is a safe haven, but compared to the yen or the euro or the Russian ruble or whatever you want to pick, it is a safe haven. At least it has been historically, which is why I own it. And during turmoil, people race to a safe haven. I suspect it's going to get very overpriced and may even turn into a bubble before mm -hmm. it's over. Uh, it doesn't mean it won't go down for a while first because it's been so strong. But the world is part of this turmoil, which you and I have been discussing, and the problems the world faces. What do you do in times like this? And the immediate reaction from many people is, ah, the U.S. dollar. And that's why I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. It's funny you say that. My daughter just said I'm supposed to take her to dance. And I said, no, I, I have to be on the radio with me, and she, she frowned. But, but here I am. Don't worry. We found another way for her to get to her dance lesson. All right, good, because I don't want to keep her from that. <laughs> God bless. That's awesome. But uh, so, Jim, um, before the uh, break cut in, you know, you were talking about the dollar. And you're talking about how historically it's always been a safe haven where people were running to. And you, you mentioned that you could possibly see this going into a bubble, which is pretty interesting because one of the things I've always believed is that the dollar, before this whole thing is said and done, that the dollar will go higher before the whole thing pops. And one of the things that I coined, it was a terminology that I coined, I, I, I called it monetary hypoxia. That this thing will just go higher and higher and higher until it eventually runs out of oxygen and, in this sense, liquidity, and the whole thing just goes pop. But um, uh, so that's where we left off. So if you want to continue to talk about that and, oh. and where you see these things going, go ahead. 
That, I happen to, to share that view. At the moment, speaking in, in March of 2016, there are a lot of bulls on the dollar, which usually means that a correction is coming. You know, when you have too many bulls on anything, I've learned, V, and I'm sure you have too, that when everybody's on one side of the boat, you better go to the other side of the boat for a while. So, and, and right now, everybody is... Most people are bullish on the dollar, so it worries me that a correction may become, which is fine. I mean, corrections are always good. It, it, it clears the air, and it makes it means things can go higher eventually. So I own a lot of dollars. It's my largest currency position, and mainly for the reasons you just said. Um, I just hope that not everybody else agrees with us, V, because if they do, then we'll have a correction. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> But, but, uh, but I'm prepared for the correction. I hope I can live through the correction. I expect it to come. My, one of my other larger, not, not nearly as large, but is that I own the Japanese yen, and I own it because there were so many bears on the yen, and it's, it's correcting. So even if the, uh, it's going up, I mean, it, so even if the, uh, the U.S. dollar does go down for a while, some of my other assets may, may help me. Right. Absolutely. Well, uh, what now? Jim, we see a lot of things happening globally, and I remember back in 2012, uh, I, I actually, uh, you know, I put a, a, an article, and I have actually was on a radio program out of, uh, I think, Canada or so, and uh, this was, an, I, you know, I reported upon, you know, Russia's purchase at that time with Morgan Stanley. They, they purchased Morgan Stanley, they didn't buy Morgan Stanley, they, they purchased Morgan Stanley's energy um, se sector, it's, you know, it's Platt's desk. And, um, you know, when that purchase was done, uh, it wasn't fully reported uh, as to the total amount of, uh, you know, the, the cost of that purchase. They never disclosed that. But one thing I did know, because, I, you know, being in commodities, I have a commodities background, I said to myself, holy crap, they just bought the second biggest player in petroleum for a lot of, um, you know, for a lot of like, for instance, I mean, at that time you were you're an airline, you were Delta, you were United, the American Airlines, whatever the heck you, you were, you had a contract with either Vital or Morgan Stanley for jet fuel. Um, Morgan Stanley's Platts desk was an integral in in pricing um, oil. Uh, they were integral, and in, they ran. You know, they had offices in New York, in London, in Singapore, and they also owned uh, a, through a subsidiary various oil tankers. So that was a big major deal. And I saw that happen. I said, okay, the Russians are definitely going to try and do something here. Will they possibly try to create a, a counter to the petrodollar? And then here comes November 2015, and all of a sudden they just launched a new pricing model where petroleum is priced in uh, rubles, and as well as you know, they're, they're, they're fiddling around with uh, whether to do it in the yuan or whatnot. And I said to myself, my God, there's the whole entire – you know, deal from Morgan Stanley, that whole platform, that whole software, that entire infrastructure resurrected and gone live and active. What do you see, Jim, with the petrodollar as it is the thing that is holding this whole thing together? Uh, do you see that being challenged? Do you see the pressure coming down on that? Well, v, uh, that's you, you were ahead of your time because, yes, many places now are looking for alternatives to the U.S. dollar for many reasons, partly because when if, if the U.S. government gets mad at you, if, if Washington says, well, he's doing the wrong thing, then they, they – they, 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 they screw you uh, because they block your U.S. dollars, and there's not much alternative. There's no alternative right now. So many people, uh, many countries are starting to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is not right. We've got to do something. We've got to have an alternative to if some bureaucrat in Washington gets angry or gets upset. So you see China, Brazil, Russia, various countries trying to now set up competing organizations, institutions, and competing currency. Uh, the Iranians now, not that they're our friends, well, they're becoming our friends, but apparently, but they now will only take euros yeah. for, for their money, for their oil. Uh, Sound like what the dollar did. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but but the but the Iranians got a treaty with us first, so right. we didn't uh, haven't assassinated them yet in any way. <laughs> so it's it's having the Chinese, as you know, and uh, many other countries are now setting up alternatives to the World Bank and the IMF. And my goodness, we certainly need alternatives to those corroded uh, institutions. Uh, they're mind-bogglingly bad. So you're seeing changes, huge geopolitical, uh, economic changes taking place in the world and partly we the u.s are bringing it on ourselves 
because we've gotten so belligerent and so arrogant that we just say you either do it my way and my way being the bureaucrat in Washington or too bad for you. So it's happening. There are alternatives. You said the Russians are t pricing in your uh, rubles now. I actually own some rubles at the moment, not many, but a few. Uh, the Chinese are setting up. There was many countries, as you know, when China said, we're going to set up an alternative to the World Bank and the IMF, the U.S. said, no, you're not. No, we're not going to let anybody join. And the next thing you know, the British, every, nearly all of our allies said, hey, we're joining. We're joining. So the U.S. is just about the only big guy that didn't join. Yeah, Everybody uh, else. Us and the Japanese, I mean, uh, from what I heard from an inside source, was that the Japanese were going to join, and all of a sudden they got a – Karuda and, and Abe got a call in the middle of the night saying, knock it off. <laughs> no, no, I, I know that happened. We all know that happened. That, that right. Washington called many people and said, don't join. But to their shock and mine – Many people said, oh, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Washington, D.C., we're, we're, uh, we're doing it, we're doing it. Uh, many of our European allies, many countries have, uh, have joined up because, I mean, I'm not the only person who sees that Asia is on the rise. Many people see that. And uh, the reality is that you cannot just stay with one monopoly provider for anything, especially if that monopoly provider is becoming uh, corroded and in some cases even corrupt. I totally agree with you. And, and uh, the World Bank and the, uh, the International Monkey Fund, has hmm. uh, <laughs> they are archaic and uh, corrupt institutions, and they're, 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 they're being done away with. And it's pretty, it's pretty interesting when I look at the landscape, Jim. I see those Western institutions corroding and, and going away, and with it, its controls, its mechanisms. I mean, let's, let's, I mean, let's look at it this way. The IMF, you know, for all intents and purposes, is an unfunded white elephant. It is, it's an empty office. I mean, the Chinese have been you know, being the main funders of it for the last two years. Washington has done nothing with it. So I'm looking at these derelict, neglected institutions that have you know, been, once been the vaunted you know, power – centers for a lot of uh, Washington's foreign policies, economic policies, and things of that sort. And I'm seeing that whole entire change with the AIIB and the, and the new development bank, formerly known as the BRICS Bank. It's amazing. And then I look at also what's going on with, with Brent and WTI. I remember when WTI, the West Texas Intermediary, was the benchmark, and that's like dying away. And now it's Brent, and then you look at Brent, Brent's dying away because every single one of those you know, North Atlantic, North Sea um, oil reserves, they're all running dry. And yep. uh, and and when I looked at that, and then I looked at what happened at that last OPEC meeting in Vienna, I almost I almost fell out of my chair when I had the uh, the one of the the, the uh, energy ministers from uh, the United Arab Emirates come forward and say, well, we're not going to act as a, uh, as a as a as a cartel anymore. It, it, we're going to act in the best interest of our customers. I said to myself, oh, my God, these guys are acting less cohesively and more as every man for himself since everybody's pumping to oblivion as the central banks are also printing to oblivion. So it's, it, it is amazing how so many of the infrastructures and institutions that we in the West have relied upon for our uh, normal day-to-day -day of, of economically functioning and, and with trade, that's all being done away with. And I'm and, and I'm seeing this whole thing arise, and you being in Asia, Jim, what about the new Silk Road? What, what is that all about with China, the new Silk Road? The Eurasian trade zone. What do you see happening with those things? Well, first of all, your your insights before were were good because uh, you we are in a very very historic period now. Always the world is always changing, but the this decade, and the next few, you're going to see stag. We are seeing, and we're going to continue to see staggering changes. It's been what 70 years since the uh, Second World War ended, which started a whole new era. But now. Many of those institutions and ways of doing things are coming to an end, and on the other side, you're going to see huge, huge, huge changes uh, going forward. The the new Silk Road, uh, the one as the Chinese call it, one belt, one road. Well, they're changing geography. It's very rare in world history that geography changes. Uh, the railroad changed geography. The steam, sh the, yeah. the fast steamships changed geography. When when the Europeans found the Western world or found the way around Africa, that changed geography. Uh, but we're seeing huge changes now. The Chinese have, are building and the Russians are building railroads 
fast railroads across uh, the continent from Asia to Europe. If you put something on a train in China now, it will get to Berlin a couple of weeks or more sooner than if you put it on the boat, and yeah. it's happening. Uh, I happen to live in Singapore, which is a huge port, and that's going to hurt Singapore a lot because of the, the shipping is going to hurt. But it is changing everything you and I know about the way the world works. They're building railroads across Myanmar, which will cut out Singapore entirely, shorten the, the boat trips enormously. And, you know, if you had lived on a city where the interstate highway came in America, you really did very well in the last few decades. Likewise, 100 years ago, if the railroad came to your town, you did extremely well. Well, that's, and I'll tell you an interesting story along this, well, I'll come back to it. But that's what's happening now with uh, the One Belt, One Road. New ports, new railroads, new highways, all are being built, which is going to change history, change geography, and therefore change history. So you should be aware of it. There are going to be opportunities. Some people are going to suffer. I mentioned Singapore, where I live. It's going to suffer uh, relatively anyway. Uh, others are going to benefit. Now, I want to tell you my story because it's a good story. Uh, and we come back to that if you want. Uh, after the Second World War, Birmingham, Alabama, Memphis, Tennessee, and Atlanta, Georgia were all about the same size and of equal importance. Birmingham and Memphis rebuilt the railroad stations. Atlanta went and built a big airport. Mm. Now, you know the rest of that story. Birmingham right. and Memphis continued to go into relative decline. Atlanta is now one of the major U.S. cities, even a world city, because somebody in Atlanta saw that the future, that the world was changing, and they put their money and their efforts into Aviation, airports, air traffic, Atlanta and Birmingham look back. I'm sorry, Memphis and Birmingham look back, and that's what's happening in the world now. The people looking forward are going to do extremely well. The people looking backward are going to go into decline or at least relative decline. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that, especially the when I was reading about the New Silk Road. Uh, what well, would take a, a 42 day sea journey, you know, by, by waterway, and they were able to cut it down to 14 days is unbelievable. Yep. And, if, and if that high speed rail system is set up with Kazakhstan, if that goes implemented, I don't know if they started on that or not, uh, they're, they're saying they could shorten that down to 10 days. And that, that's just massive. Massive, and this is what kills me here, uh, Jim. It's, it's, we, we must be ruled by idiots because. We have this backward gunboat diplomacy, this this failed British model of of, of conquest that we're so hell bent upon, where we go into a, a third world country or or develop an emerging economy, and we literally have them at gunpoint. Give us the goods. This is a stick up. Do what we say, and nobody gets hurt. Whereas I see the Russians and the Chinese and the, even the Indians. Uh, they're going into these places like in Africa, and they are cutting mutually beneficial deals. And I remember from studying history, when you looked at the old colonial European powers and what they did in Africa, they would have you know, rail lines, and those rail lines would go directly from the mines directly to the ports. And that's how it always was. But what the, what the Chinese and the Russians are doing, they're literally building infrastructure where the rails are running everywhere, the highways are going everywhere, hospitals are popping up. And people are willing to trade with them. And it's amazing to me that we, and I believe that, you know, uh, being an American, we are like the greatest businessmen. We are so business savvy. And to see other people in, in other parts of the world literally winning the world over without firing a single bullet, I stand at awe. Well, I stand at awe and I grieve as well because yes. I. I am an American citizen, and my family are the same. Uh, you're very, it's very uh, good uh, insight about Africa because we would go there, and we would say, "Okay, now we want this is what we want," and you do it. Now you do things our way, which didn't make a lot of Africans happy. The Chinese go there now and say, "Okay, we will pay you top dollar for the assets, and then we'll go away and leave you alone. You leave us alone, and." Everybody will make a lot of money together, and you do it your way, and we'll do it our way. Now, the, the Africans, again, I don't like this. I've been to Africa many times, but you will see 
that the Africans really, really are flocking to China, and China's flocking to, to uh, Africa. The Chinese have had every head of state in from Africa into China several times in the last few years. They've had big gatherings. The Chinese leadership have been to all the African countries. I think even Obama's only been to one or two. You know, virtually no American presidents have been to Africa in the past many decades. And the Chinese are everywhere. And people wonder why someday, you know, we're going to wake up and Washington's going to start screaming about who lost Africa. You lost Africa, Washington, D.C. You neglected them. You bossed them around. You were arrogant. And the Chinese went there and did what good capitalists do. They pay top dollar, and they're running top businesses and building top infrastructure. You, we, Washington, D.C., lost Africa. And it's, it's another thing that we're all going to grieve about uh, in a few decades, years, not decades, years. I'm grieving about it now because I love Africa so much and have been there so many times and seeing it happen. Uh, to I totally agree. And um, you know, it, it, it's, the, it's amazing. I mean, the first thing we do in Africa – uh, the first real major American presence. It, it's not a, 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 a uh, an infrastructure project. It's not uh, a trade agreement. It's not a economic project. It's not even a humanitarian project. The first major thing that the United States did in Africa is Africom. African yeah. It was a military venture. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. And, and I say to myself, the amount of money that is wasted on on defense, it's it's ridiculous. And you know, one of the things I've noticed, Jim, is you know, back in the days, you know, we, these these bureaucrats start these bridges to nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I look at how over budgeted and overspent the defense industry is, and now I think we really have defense projects to nowhere. I mean, whereas. You know, you would have a bridge project, which would be maybe you know ten million, a couple of million, a hundred million dollars on, on infrastructure. Now you have weapon systems, like case in point, the flying lemon, known as the F thirty five. It's a fat pig that can't fly, it can't turn, it can't shoot, it can't save it, it can't even get out of its own way to save its own life. That fat bloated pig of a plane, that thing is running defense costs into the trillions. It, I mean, it, it's a defense project to nowhere, and I'm flabbergasted that American taxpayer money is spent on such frivolous nonsense. Unbelievable. And then you see the Chinese come out a week later with a plane that looks very similar but actually flies and can turn. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I, I'm glad you said it because if you're the American press, the spin will be, don't worry, everything's going to be okay, and exactly. we'll be come out ahead in the end. But, you know, B, we have, we have troops in over 120 countries around the world. Right. We're spending a huge amount of money making enemies. Most of those guys are not getting us friends. They're making enemies in most places. But you and I are paying for it. Uh, we have huge problems in the U.S., and yet we're spending staggering amounts of money on all of these on planes that don't fly, on you know, on things that sit around, costing money and making enemies. And I, 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 just to go back for the Chinese for a moment, the Chinese don't have armies stationed around the world. Unfortunately, and they're spending all their money at home developing their own economy, their own schools, their own infrastructure, whereas we're spending our money on making enemies. And again, it grieves me. I don't like saying any of this, right. but but it's 2016. I have to live on facts and, and, and what's happening in the world and analysis. I cannot spend my time thinking this is 1956 because it's not 1956. No, no it really isn't. What do you think is going to happen um, to the dollar as world reserve currency? Well, there are people already trying. There's no alternative right now, but there are people looking for to develop alternatives. The, the, the BRICS banks, as you mentioned sure. before, uh, they are trying to come up with ways and alternatives and competing currencies or payments part of this problem is the payment system the payment everything has to be go to go to in US dollars has to go through New York or through the US to clear dollars if you're doing something in dollars it has to go through the US and the US has controls the system and therefore the US bureaucrats can say too bad we don't like you 
we're going to block it. So that has made many people unhappy and upset, and so they are developing alternative payment systems, which means they're developing alternative currency systems. I don't know what yet is going to emerge. I would suspect that the uh, renminbi, the Chinese currency, will emerge. I mean, that's a crazy statement right now. It's, still, it's not even a freely tradable currency at the moment. It's moving in that direction, but the only thing I can see right. on the horizon would be the renminbi. Minby. We need some. The world needs something to compete with the U.S. dollar. I suspect it will be the renminbi, and who knows? Maybe something else down the road. But, but again, we've shot ourselves in the foot. We've made so many people angry that they've said we got to find something, some alternative, something to compete. And in your lifetime, my lifetime, my children's lifetime, you're going to see other. Once upon a time, the it was the British pound sterling that dominated right. the world. Well, that changed. Once upon a time, it was many other currencies. That all changed as the world changed, and we're living in interesting times, unfortunately. That's a, that's a, Chinese, cur that's a Chinese curse, by the way. May you live in, may you live in interesting times. <laughs> we certainly <laughs> are. <laughs> because the interesting times usually cause turmoil and, and uh, chaos in some cases. I totally. Uh, the Middle East. What a mess it's been. We have – look, I, you know, I put an article on RogueMoney.net. Um, it's called Not Mageddon because you know, a lot of people are thinking what's happening in the Middle East, Armageddon, it's the end of the world, this, that, and the other. And what I'm trying to say is it's, it's not because uh, even though Erdogan, who, whom I call the turd in the hummus bowl, <laughs> lack of a better word, well, the, guy, the man's nuts. <laughs> well, that's – I haven't read your article, but I will have to say – and, and I don't know, but that's there are lots of people in the Middle East making mistakes these days. Oh. It's staggering. It's not just oh. not just one or two. It's not Correct. just the Arabs and the Israelis or some. My gosh, there are at least a dozen people. Yes. You, you sit and say, how could that happen? And then you look to your left and say, how could that happen? And then they just one <laughs> after another, one after another. They're all. Uh, and but again, you and I are going to pay for this. Uh, you, uh, you and I are going to pay for this. V and the listeners. Fortunately, I hope, and it's obvious that you're you're knowledgeable and are getting prepared. But I mean, go ahead because what what the Turks are doing, you they're dumbfounded. But then, what everybody's, what the Americans are doing, what everybody's doing is mind-boggling. Yeah, and uh, it, it, unfortunately, it unfortunately, is. unfortunately, because of all those mistakes. You know, you look back at history and you see that uh, wars come out of places where there's a lot of turmoil and, and currents, cross currents, such as before the First World War down in uh, the southeastern part of Europe. There were all sorts of crazy things going on. And the next thing you know, it was, it was called World War I. Uh, I. I don't like what I see there, but because so many people are making mistakes, I, I mean – if you and I sat down and talked about who's doing what to whom, we would be – most people would say it's incomprehensible. How can that happen? How can the Turks be doing this? How can the Iranians be doing that? How can, how can the Americans be doing the other? And yet we are. Correct. Absolutely right. And you know, I, I look at the whole entire situation. I see it's almost as uh, uh, the, the, the gall that the Turks have in, in the sense of – you know, here they are. I mean, the uh, devil tell you, the, the his, Erdogan's uh, right hand man being in Berlin uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was, or a month ago, where he was literally telling uh, the European delegations that were there that either A, you give us cash, B, you give us concessions, and C, you accelerate our membership into the EU. Otherwise, we're going to just keep on opening up the spigots for these refugees. And these uh, migrants, quote unquote, to start pouring into your border to make it your problem, and and I, I was flabbergasted by the thuggery, the pure thuggery of this whole entire thing. And then when the Germans and even the American delegation that were present, they said, "Okay, well, you're going to stop killing the Kurds, right?" And uh, and they're like, "No, we're going to keep killing the Kurds." Right. The I was dumbfounded. 
Uh, I, listen, I, I will repeat uh, it, it, we, we could spend two or three days talking about who's doing what to whom uh, in the Middle East, and, and we could start yeah. with the Turks if you want to. We could talk with, start with Mr. Erdogan, uh, but I assure you two years from now, Mr. Erdogan or whoever his successor is is going to be doing equally strange things, but so is everybody else. It's the escalation. I mean, look at Libya. Just we're bombing Libya now. And what do we? Why, right. why do we? Why do we leave these people alone? If you ask me, and not that they would, because it's too radical for them. I would just say, listen, let's just leave them alone. Let them kill each other off. They all hate each other. They are all trying to kill each other. Let's let them do it. And then the, they will solve the problem. We will save huge amounts of money, many, many, many lives. We can protect America. We can spend the money in, in Nebraska or Oregon or wherever you want to spend it. Uh, let's just let them blow each other up. Why are we blowing them all up? Because we're that's not helping us. And so, yes, I'm, I agree with you. It doesn't matter. But it, from my view, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about Erdogan in Turkey or it's Joe Smith in someplace else or Mary Jones someplace else. They're all doing it. And we're getting involved. And we should leave them alone. Let them blow each other up. Right. I agree. But that wouldn't fit the neocon model, unfortunately. They, they, they just have to get involved. <laughs> I, I know, but it, I wish it were. I wish it were just the neocons, but it's everybody. I it mean, is everybody. All, I mean, Hillary Clinton thinks she's smarter than UV. She thinks she's smarter than everybody. The, the Clintons went to Ivy League schools, and they think that they're smarter than all the rest of us. Well, Jim, she's smart enough to to keep a server, a high security server, in her bathroom. She's brilliant. <laughs> I told you, she went to an Ivy League school. She thinks she's smarter than you, V. That's they it. all do. That's they it. all think they're smarter than you. Yeah. And they tell um, each other. They tell yeah. each other every day. Well, you know, we're better educated. We're more knowledgeable. We're, we, can, we can make better decisions than other people. Yeah. Unfortunately, they cannot. The market is smarter than they are. The world is smarter than they are. Unfortunately, you and I are paying for it. Right. So, so Jim, in terms of uh, some of the solutions here, one of my favorite topics is uh, precious metals. What is your take? Where do you see metals going, and uh, why is it important? And why is countries like China and Russia and and India stocking up on it at a at a rapid clip? Well, I own a lot of gold, a lot of silver. I haven't bought uh, very much in the last few years because I expect uh, a, a great opportunity to buy gold co will come up. It may not. Who knows? Uh, if it does, I'll buy, I hope I'm smart enough to buy more. If it doesn't, I certainly, I certainly own uh, plenty of V. Uh, gold and silver have been around for a few thousand years, and I'm sure that there are many – I know that there are many politicians who say that it's, we should ignore gold and silver, uh, but that's for their interest. It's not for your interest or mine. Fortunately, I would like to go along with you know the, the great unwashed, all of us who are so dumb that we don't know that gold is, is barbaric and should be abolished, and I, I own it, and if it goes down a lot, I'm going to buy a lot more because my view of the world is there is turmoil coming. Uh, the, the way I actually think it's going to happen is the dollar is going to go higher, as you and I discussed. Yep. That may put more pressure on gold and silver. If so, when the time comes to sell my dollars, if it works, if it works that way, then gold and silver will be down. And I can swap my dollars for uh, gold, more gold and silver, or who knows? It may be the renminbi or something else. But that's how I see the world evolving. Uh, I own it. I mainly own coins uh, because if you own bullion, it's hard to go into the grocery store and say, "Hey, I need uh, three loaves of bread." Because the guy can't. can't, can't, can't. First of all, he doesn't know. First of all, he doesn't know if your bullion is real or not. And second of right. all, he, he, he can't make change. <laughs> you know, so, Here's my 400-ounce so good delivery bar. <laughs> exactly. You know, guaranteed by various and sundry people. He's going to look at you and say, well, thank you. I'll take that. And you, but I cannot give you change. You know, take, take as much bread as you want. So I, I mainly own uh, gold and silver coins, but I concur with you. Now, there's a big move in the world to – get rid of gold and silver by many governments because they don't like it. Uh, they want to have a cashless society, which will put even more pressure. Well, I'm not sure if it will put more pressure on gold and silver or more, uh, make more demand for gold and silver because if we cannot have cash, then the only alternative may be at that point gold and silver. But, but B, 
you know these guys. They're going to do things like make it illegal to make to do business in gold and silver. Right. They make make it illegal to take gold and silver across borders. Mm -hmm. They're they're after us. <laughs> they're always after us uh, to maintain their own power. But I own it. I would be buying more. Uh, but. I have to continue to listen to Revolution Radio, I guess, to find out how it's all going to evolve. Right. You know, you won't go, are you bullish on gold and silver? I'm a huge thing. You know, one of the things I've been saying for years is, um, is I don't care what the spot is. I'm, I'm going to keep buying. Of course, I, you know, I buy on the dips whenever it drops low, and uh, I hold it. I, I, you know, in the last couple of months, it's been great buying opportunities in gold. Um, you know, and you know the uh, the company that I that I'm uh, working with in the, in Hong Kong and as well as in Singapore. And one of the things I'm able to do just being talking with these guys and because they you know they see a lot of the movement of gold uh, globally. Um, there is such a fever pitch in Asia. Like when I when I see these pictures if, coming out of Hong Kong where you know people are lining up ten thousand deep, uh, waiting online and they're not waiting online to buy the newest iPhone. They're waiting online to buy gold because the spot price just went down and they're gonna jump on it. Uh, it's tremendous, man. And 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 you know when I see the changes that are happening in in the London price fix, that that's literally you know going to shambles. Kind of like how the banksters got rid of M3 money reporting. Uh, we knew that something was up at and in January thirtieth uh, of two thousand fifteen when they got rid of the 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 gold forwarding rate, the GoFo rate. When they got rid of that, you know, showing you the real market demand for gold. When they got rid of that, we knew that something was seriously being cooked up here because, uh, you know, that you know the, the, the manipulation that's been occurring on the back end has been tremendous. But you know, but but V, that's because yeah. they don't want you to be independent. Correct. They don't want you to be able to escape from their clutches. Right. Uh, they want to maintain their power. And V, I want to remind you, they're smarter than us. Correct. They went to they went to Ivy League schools they and they're smarter than us. They know what's good for us. Yes. You know we live in the land of the free, but we're not so free anymore because no. they they are smarter than we are. Right. And they don't want to lose their jobs. Right. They and don't want to listen. And their paper will save us. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah yeah yeah. If not their paper, something will save us. Don't worry, exactly. we're smarter than you. We will save you. Oh my gosh. You know, one of the things that, they're not good for my nervous. This conversation is not good for my nervous system. <laughs> I, I think if we ever have this conversation again in the future, I think we both need to sit down with a uh, with a nice drink on the side, and then we'll be able to discuss all this. <laughs> Take more than one drink, more than one. I'm afraid. <laughs> well, I owe you a couple of cold ones, Jim. <laughs> okay, I, I accept. I accept. But unfortunately, it's 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 ten o'clock in the morning here, so I'm not going to have. <laughs> I gotta have one now. <laughs> no, no, that's no, too early. <laughs> it's too early. You know what's astounding to me, Jim, is that um, is when I look at the when I you know when I travel the world and I talk to people from all over, is how many people that are that are abroad that live in other countries have offshore accounts or they have things you know set away that nobody else could touch or they have at all, you know offshore asset protected trusts in in you know various safe jurisdictions. And uh, like, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, like 80 percent of people that are in Saudi Arabia or, or a good chunk of them have a, an offshore account or some of something of that sort set up. And when I look at the average American where less than two or three percent has anything set up offshore, it's unbelievable. And I, and I yeah. see the importance of it just to have some sort of monetary freedom. Well, I, I look at it as insurance, if nothing else. Everybody yes. listening to this has health insurance, car insurance, fire insurance, life insurance. You hope that you never have to use your fire insurance. I look upon international diversification as an insurance policy of nothing else. It, if, if the world doesn't come to an end and, you, and all your money is in the U.S., fine. But if you ever need your fire insurance or your health insurance, you're very glad you have it. So, uh, and the great opportunities in other places besides the U.S. If you'd invested in Germany 50 years ago, you'd have made a whole lot more money than in the U.S. or Japan or something like that, or Singapore 40 years ago or Hong Kong 30 years ago. No, there are great opportunities outside your own country, whatever your own country is. And I would I say this to Germans and Australians and everybody else. Everybody, 
everybody should have some insurance of having some of their assets outside their own country, no matter how good their own country is. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's amazing to me. It's us and a little despotic little country in Africa called Eritrea. I think I don't even know if I'm even pronouncing it correctly. Yeah, Eritrea. Yeah, Eritrea, right. Only two countries in the world that actually tax their citizens who live abroad, wants their citizens to report on their funds, want to know everything about you. It's unbelievable, man. Well, yes, I mean, you raise a lot of interesting, uh, even more interesting questions. I can see you're pretty knowledgeable about what's happening. Yeah, America is the only country in the world, nearly the only country in the world that taxes you no matter where. Uh, there are people who have not been in the U.S. for many, many years and don't earn a penny in the U.S., and yet, right. if they have an American passport, they have to pay American taxes and report everything they do, you know, every afternoon, every morning to the U.S. government. Now, that's not the way it is in anywhere else in the world except yeah. Eritrea. Uh, now, is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. Uh, I'll leave that to the American voters to decide. Now, I, I would vote against it because I don't quite – I mean, I go to the U.S. a lot, and I vote, and I pay taxes, et cetera. But there are many right. people I, – I know people are giving up their citizenship just because they are so afraid that they might yeah. make a mistake on their taxes, uh, an innocent mistake, that they would be crucified. So, no, you, you bring up some very interesting and insightful points, which I, now I, I have many assets outside the U.S. and have for over 50 – well, not over, but yeah, over 50 years. But uh, – and I pay taxes. I report them all because I know there are penalties if you don't. Uh, but it's not, a, it's not a just or wise system if you ask me. I, I and we're, dri we're driving people away. Yeah, there are Americans who are giving up their citizenship. Not me, but there are some. But there are many other foreigners who will not take their money to the U.S. Now, will not invest in the U.S. Now, plenty do. Don't get me wrong. But there are others who say, "Wait a minute, no, I'm not getting into that nightmare, uh, that potential nightmare." So we're shooting ourselves in the foot, whether we know it or not. Yeah, I I wholeheartedly agree, and I, I, it's almost as if we are. Um I mean, we're in a nationwide brain drain, a nationwide talent drain. It seems like our best and our brightest are seeking other pastures in order for them to go forth and make their investments and their riches and, and you know, create wealth for them and security for themselves. It, it kind of reminds me of back in the 80s when you had, uh, you know, a colleague of mine always reminded me of this, where Washington State was in such an upheaval economically that, uh, I mean, they were in massive layoffs. Boeing looked like it was about to go under. And there was a, a, a headline, I think it was on the Washington Tribune or, or one of the newspapers or the Seattle Times, something like that, where it says, well, the last person leaving Washington remember to turn the lights off. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. And I, and I, and I feel it's, it's, it's literally I'm living the novel Atlas Shrugged. Literally. <laughs> ah, ah, yes, yes. Well, unfortunately, you happen to be correct. Yeah, uh, that we're 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 not doing good things in America. I mean, I again, I, I hate saying all of this, V, yeah, so because I. I am an American citizen, voter, etc. Some of my happiest times have been in the U.S. Uh, fortunately, I've had very very happy times outside the U.S. too. Mm -hmm. I do know there's another way to do things. But most of us, most Americans, don't have much international exposure or experience. You know, a third of American congressmen, when they're elected, do not have passports. Yes. And I don't, I don't know the statistics for the nation as a whole, but most Americans have no clue about the rest of the world, which is a part of the problem of our education system. Right. Most Americans couldn't find the Pacific Ocean on a map. Or know why it matters. Who cares where the Pacific Ocean is? <laughs> or, you know, what difference does it make? Right. Well, unfortunately, it makes a big difference, and the world is becoming more and more international as we speak and as we live. I'm trying to teach my children as much about the world as I can because I know that in their lifetimes, they better know about the world or they're going to suffer. Yeah, absolutely right. And I think there was a statistic uh, I read somewhere that – um, the only other people that are least tra are less traveled than Americans um, are North Koreans. And I don't know exactly where the cross-section of the demographics where they got that from, but I kind of can see that. I mean, you know, apart from your you know, coastal cities or your main hub cities like in New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, things of that sort, 
uh, where you have people that are that that do travel abroad. There's a good mixture of demographics there. When I get into the heartland of the country, and when I talk to people that are you know that are in the heart of the United States, they not only do not not travel abroad. Uh, you know, I love when they say this. They're like, "America's the greatest country in the world." I'm like, "Okay, well, have you been anywhere else?" No, I will never leave this country. Like, <laughs> okay, well, that kind of limits your expertise in saying that this is the greatest country in the world. And um, and it's it's shocking to me where they can't find Syria on a map, but they are more than willing to advocate bombing it. But at yes. the same time, they're, they're pro-life. <laughs> I mean, what? Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, now, you and I are, are having fun at the expense of Americans, and it's absolutely everything you say is correct. I, I, unfortunately, many people like that in the world have traveled yes. the world a few times. Are, we're, Americans are not the only one who, ones who don't understand. We're the worst, or among the worst, as you point yeah. out, but there are plenty of other people. You talked about Erdogan before and the Turks. I mean, goodness knows, Ugh. plenty of Turks making plenty of mistakes. Oh, my God. Uh, but in America, it is – it's one of the – now, we, it's one of our great strengths ha historically that we were somewhat isolated geographically yes. and could, be, could afford to be isolated. But those days are gone. This is not 1916. This is 2016, and those oceans – now, what, at one point, they were great advantages for America. Now, it turns out, are not so not so good for Americans. And I I know that travel is the best way to educate yourself. Forget going to an Ivy League school. Travel, travel. You'll learn a lot more if you travel on your own, not a, not on a tour, not on a tour group. Travel is is perhaps. I have my wife. Uh, from a small town in North Carolina. She hadn't been very much. She and I went around the world, and she will tell you over and over and over again that travel opened her eyes and taught her more than anything else that she's ever done in her life. And I'll tell you the same thing. I grew up in the backwoods of Alabama. You know, I didn't even know where China was when I was eight years old. Now my children can speak Chinese at age, at age two. You know, they can speak Chinese. So I know that travel will teach everybody a lot, and I wish, I wish that we could somehow give every American a passport and say, okay, guys, now go see something. Go see somewhere. Even if you don't have a good time, go and have the experience. If you get rich, I hope you give everybody a passport. I give, I give people passports all the time when I travel. It um, doesn't cost very much, uh, and it's, it's a cheap way to change people's lives. Oh, I totally agree. Jim, we got about 10 minutes left. What are some of the solutions that you suggest for people to uh, protect themselves? Uh, well, how many days do you have? Uh, and, and Novi, that's the most important thing we need to be addressing in 2016 because it is going to be a huge problem going down the road. Um, the first thing I say to everybody is please uh, stay with what you know. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to V even. Don't listen to anybody. Uh, stay with what you know because I – listen, first of all, I make mistakes. Oh, V, let me tell you about my first wife. You want to talk about <laughs> mistakes? Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, I ran into her the other day quite by – I'm so glad. At the time, I was miserable when we, when we split, uh, but now I am so, so, so glad. So we all learn from mistakes. I hope hey, we I, I, I could tell you about mine as well, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everybody listening to this show can tell you about their first spouse and what a problem it was. Uh, but stay with what you know. Uh, stay only with what you know. Uh, I can tell you what I'm doing, and I have told you some of the things I'm doing, but – uh, if you don't know anything about gold or investing in currencies, please don't do it until you yourself are very knowledgeable about it. Because if you stay with what you know, when problems come, you'll at least know why you own that, and you'll know what to do with it because you know more about it than I do for sure. But I urge everybody to learn something about the world. Everybody probably has some country that they 
read about or like or partial to, even if they never, even if they don't have a passport. I suggest you get a passport and go visit that country uh, and learn more about it and maybe put some assets there. That is very high on my list of priorities, that everybody have some of their money diversified into another country, but don't invest there until you know about it. Uh, uh, the main thing is know, investing what you know. Now, things that I'm very keen on, I'm very keen on agriculture, buy yourself a farm. But if you don't know about farming, if you don't like being in the sun, you probably shouldn't buy a farm uh, or become a farmer. Uh, but I'm very optimistic about some countries in the world. But if you cannot find any place on the map, wait until you're knowledgeable. I mean, even Canada, uh, most Americans, unfortunately, can't find Canada on the map, but Canada <laughs> might be a place just next to us. You might think about learning about Canada or other countries that are close by. So international diversification, agriculture, precious metals at the right prices, what you know most uh, at the right prices, that's where you should uh, invest. I can give you a long list of things, but, but uh, V... My, my first thing would be don't listen to me. You can listen to me for suggestions or ideas or places that you can investigate yourself. But if you start listening to people you hear on the radio or people you hear on the Internet or people you hear on the television, you're going to lose a lot of money, right. a lot of money. Right. Uh, so the most important thing is, and if you don't know anything about anything, which is understandable at the moment for many people, um, Start learning. Start educating yourself. Put your money in the bank. At the moment, in my view, the U.S. dollar is okay. Put your money in the bank while you educate yourself. Save more money. Do more education. There's going to be a time, which V and I have discussed before, that the U.S. dollar is not going to be a good place to be. But at the moment, in my view anyway, it's okay. I own a lot of U.S. dollars. But V, 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 I want to emphasize again. Don't listen to me or anybody else. Stay with what you yourself know. Right. You can listen to me, but don't listen to me. <laughs> and what I would always say is, is, is empower yourself. You know, if, if you haven't learned something, now's the time to learn. I mean, we're 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 heading furlong into this into into a fork in the road. Either you're going to be powerful or you're going to be pitiful, but you can't be both, folks. Now's the time to get educated, motivated, learn. And I think, Jim, I think as you know, time is going on, I think we all need to be like think tanks where we take in a lot of intelligence, a lot of knowledge, study it, hold on to that which is good, hold on to that which is beneficial for us, discard the rest because all the solutions that are given, it's not going to work for everybody. One size does not fit all. We all have individual needs, individual concerns, and you have to be educated enough to figure it out. I mean, we're at the stage right now, Jim, like, you know, most people, they, you know, they open up a brokerage account with a broker. Okay, well, now the market, only, you know, we went from, you know, performance-based to just volume-based where, you know, it's not about the client anymore. And I, I hear horror stories from people that are saying, hey, you know, you know my fund is getting, is getting bled out. And people are just asking their broker, can we just stop the bleeding? They're not even asking to pull the fund out. They're not doing any of that. We just want to stop the bleeding. And the guy on the other phone is just like, uh, there's no problem, and they just hang up, you know? I know. I, I, that's why, that's why, V, I want to say, if, you, if people only remember one thing from me, it is don't invest in anything unless you yourself know a lot about it. Just, it's better to earn one half of 1% a year than to lose one half of 1% a year, Absolutely. much less to lose 5 or 10% a year. So please, do nothing, do nothing. Don't even listen to V unless you yourself know a lot about what you're doing. Maybe exactly. I shouldn't say don't listen to V. No, no, do your own homework. That's that's the most important thing. That's that's how we empower people. Don't you know? Don't take our word for it. Do your own homework, but just use us as reference material. That's all it is. Just reference us and find out if what we're saying is legit, if it's true, and then do your own work. Put your put your back into it and learn. Well, that's good. If you say, well, I heard some guy on the, on the radio say he was bullish on agriculture, and so I'm going to go learn about agriculture because I really like being outdoors. I like growing things, et cetera. Then, and you do it. 
fine. But if you don't like agriculture, if you don't think you could grow a, a petunia, much less a pumpkin, then for goodness sakes, don't do it. I couldn't. I'd be a terrible farmer. But I'm very optimistic. I found other ways to invest in agriculture. But I certainly know enough about myself. You don't want to put me on a tractor. You don't want to put me out there <laughs> trying to milk cows or grow things. Some people love it. Yeah. And it's got a great future, a great future in my view. Definitely. Jim, we got about a minute left. Uh, why don't you give out uh, how do people find you? Talk about your book real quick and uh, your website. Or, well, or yeah, I don't have any, anything to sell. I'm afraid. My books, yeah, you can go by my, my, my 